taking responsibility, because the Bible has a lot to say about taking responsibility for your own actions, um, and specifically for your own sin. And we're going to talk about why that's important uh, in relationship to complaining. So, tonight we're going to talk about uh, David's sin with Bathsheba from a couple of different, uh, couple of different aspects. Uh, first, we're going to talk about what actually happened, and then we're going to talk about what we read in the Psalms uh, that tell us sort of about David's state of mind before and after uh, he is confronted about his sin, and then what that says about personal responsibility. So, uh, to sum up, uh, the story takes place in 2 Samuel 11. Now, David's not where he's supposed to be. He's in Jerusalem instead of leading the ark. Uh, why is that important, that he's not where he's supposed to be? Because he sees something he's not supposed to see. Yeah. He sees something he's not supposed to see because he's not where he is probably supposed to be. And that tells you a lot about how to avoid temptation a lot of times is... Be where you're supposed to be. You know, if you don't want to lust, don't go to a strip club. You know, be where you're supposed to be. Now, he's walking on the roof, and he sees a woman bathing, Bathsheba. Um, right there, he has the opportunity to do something, right? He could turn away and go back into his palace. I mean... He has the opportunity right there to make a decision, and he makes a bad decision. He sends servants to bring Bathsheba uh, to him, and then he sleeps with her. But that's not where it ends, because the worst thing that could happen for David happens, she gets pregnant. And now, he is forced to try to cover up his sin. And to do that, he invites Uriah the Hittite back to Jerusalem because the army is at the city of Rabbah and Uriah the Hittite is one of his mighty men. He invites him back to Jerusalem and tries to get him to go home to his wife for the night. In other words, if Uriah does that, then it looks like the baby's his and problem solved for David, right? Well, Uriah has too much honor to do that. So Uriah says... I'm not going to go sleep in my house with my wife while my brethren are encamped in the field. I'm not going to do it. I'm going to, you know, I'm trying to share in their hardships. So I'm not going to do it. So, David has Uriah killed in the siege of Rabbah by arranging for his own men to retreat and leave him to die. Now, he gives that order to Joab. And does anybody remember how he, how he does so? Yeah, Uriah sent them the message. Yeah, he sends the message by Uriah's own hand, right? Now, that tells you something right there. Uriah was so trustworthy, he didn't even open the communications that was being sent to Joab about himself. I mean, David, David here just, that's, it's despicable is what it is, to send someone's own you know, murder, basically, to send his own command to be murdered by his own hand. Now, where was Rabbah? Uh, Rabbah is actually the, uh, the Old Testament name for the city of Ammon, which, the city of Ammon, is the capital of modern-day Jordan. So the city of Ammon is on the other side of the uh, Jordan River, you can kind of see on this big map here where Jerusalem is, where Rabbah is. It's about 100 kilometers by road from Jerusalem. So 2 Samuel 11 talks about how he sent for Uriah, Uriah came. This was not just a, uh, a normal trip, right? The Israelites are at war with Ammon. So he has to first off send the messenger who has to travel about 100 kilometers to the city of Rabbah, where they're besieging the city, and then Uriah has to travel about 100 kilometers back in order to, in order to, to 
sit in their to come to Jerusalem to receive these orders. Now, um, he sends him back 100 kilometers back to the city where he then falls in the siege. So, and it's not an easy trip. You have to go down a mountain into the Jordan River Valley and back up into the mountains both ways. So this is a long and arduous trip. Uh, but, you know, David will spare no expense in trying to cover up what he's done. So no big deal to him if, if he will have to do this. Now. Uh, David, do you, yes. um, well, I can't remember, do, so they're walking, there, there's not a chariot or something, is that correct? Well, I assume they could have ridden horses, but still, 100 kilometers is like yeah. 70, 60, 60, how many? 62. 62, there we go, Somebody <laughs> in the 62 miles. Still though, that's, uh, that's probably at least three days, three, four days over a horse. So plus okay. you're going okay. over mountainous terrain, you're going over desert, so it's okay. not like you're like you're riding really hard to do that. Uh, question? No? Okay. So um, how long yeah, well actually we'll, we'll get into that here just a, in just a moment here. Um, so David does this. He commits this sin with Bathsheba, then to cover it up, he has someone murdered. Well, uh, God, of course, is not very pleased with this. So what does God do? God sends the prophet Nathan, who then confronts David. Who remembers the story that he tells David? Anybody? Yeah, there's a, a person with one ewe lamb that is part of the family, sleeps in a house, and there's all the sorts of There's a rich man who has a large flock, and a visitor comes, and so the rich man takes the lone ewe lamb and slaughters it for the meal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's the story of someone who has abundant possessions, and yet he steals from someone who is just destitute, basically. Um, steals from that person instead of using his own possessions. And David, of course, is just filled with righteous anger. It says, David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. And he said to Nathan, as the Lord lives, the man who has done this deserves to die. And he shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and because he had no pity. So it seems like David's not, you know, totally off the reservation. He has this righteous anger. Now, I guess... You, might wonder why is he angry at this point um, he's been sitting on his sin for a while now we'll talk about how long that may have been why is he angry now well as, as, the, you know, as one of the like the judges of Israel um, you know Nathan goes to him and so that's just the rule of the land, that you have to repay uh, your sin or your the thing that you did that was wrong. It is. It is. Specifically, though, I, I, think, I think it's interesting here. As the Lord lives. So David's invoking the name of the Lord in this judgment. While he himself is still carrying the guilt of this sin with Bathsheba and the subsequent cover-up and murder. So, he's not, he's not quite left the reservation completely, has he? He still has a sense of what's right and wrong. And in this instance, his sense of right and wrong is just kindled against the man in this story. So, he's not left completely. He still has a, a, he still has a strong feeling of what's right and wrong. But in his own life, He's chosen to kind of push his sin to the side, hasn't he? They ignore his sin, and I don't know if he thought if he just left it alone long enough, it would go away, that it was never going to come back to bite him. I don't know what he thought. But at this point, at least, he's pronouncing judgment on other people while his sin is still there lingering, and he's done nothing about it. Now, 
Nathan says, you are the man. And not the good way, right? <laughs> not like your man. <laughs> Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I anointed you king over Israel, and I delivered you out of the hand of Saul. I gave you your master's house and your master's wives and your arms and gave you the house of Israel and Judah. And if this were too little, I would add to you much more. Why have you despised the word of the Lord to do what is evil in his sight? You struck down your riot the Hittite with the sword, have taken his wife to be your wife, and have killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. So basically, after David pronounces this judgment on this man, Nathan says, you're that man. You just pronounced judgment on yourself. You're the one who deserves to die here, right? The Lord has given you all this stuff. God has blessed David from the very beginning. And, I mean, David has had some pretty, uh, pretty spectacular, I won't say coincidences, because I don't think they were, but there have been some pretty, pretty spectacular instances of deliverance with David, right? I mean, think about the times when he had Saul come after him. And at least twice on two occasions, David escapes from Saul unscathed. In both instances, Saul brings 3,000 men to pursue David. And it's 3,000 men against David's small little band of people. And somehow, David manages to have access to Saul both times, has the chance to kill him both times, doesn't do it, and talks Saul into leaving both times. I mean, that's that's providence. God has watched out for David in everything and has blessed him everywhere he turned. When David fought Goliath, right? How many times did he have to sling that stone to hit Goliath, was it? It's just once, right? What are the odds of that happening without divine help? You know? God has blessed David with all sorts of wives and children, right? By this point, David has numerous children, and you start reading about them and the problems they cause in chapter 12, or same chapter 12. But uh, he's got numerous children, numerous possessions. He's had this blessing his entire life, and instead what he does is he takes someone else's wife and has that man killed. You know, the thoughts of David must have been, how much, you know, how much does he know? <laughs> you know, and then he, he lays it all out. I mean, just, you know, he tells him what he did. And it's like, well, how did he find out? You know, you know that sort of thing. So only God could be behind it. Yes. Well, as a side note, I think it's interesting. Uh, we can take Nathan's strategy of describing a hypothetical situation, a story that showed, clearly shows moral that David could immediately see because he wasn't, he personally wasn't involved in that. It's always really easy for us to see things real clearly about other people, but not ourselves. So sometimes that's what we need. We need a an outside concept or a story or something that helps us see the issue. And then when that's clear, then we can apply it to ourselves, perhaps. And that's obviously works very well here. That's a very interesting aspect of this rebuke, isn't it? Is that Nathan doesn't just come to David and say, you committed adultery, you had someone murdered. He tells him a story, lets David have the angry reaction and then says, the person you're having that angry reaction about is yourself. I mean, yeah, because very often the issue is not, I don't think the issue very often is that we have no idea what's right and wrong. A, a lot of those things we can almost know instinctively. It's just that we decide not to do it, or we're tempted, we're blinded to what we have done ourselves. Um, and sometimes I feel like Christians, when they try to work with somebody, they just want to keep hammering this is what's right, this is wrong, and that's not really the issue. The issue is we're not, we're, we're blind to our own uh, iniquity. And that's the issue, it's not necessarily a knowledge problem. Yeah, that's a good comment. Okay, so, 
How long has it been, though, between when David sins and when this rebuke comes in? Well, from the text, and I won't get into it, we can assume it's probably at least a month and a half between when David sleeps with Bathsheba and when he has Uriah killed. That's just because of what the text says. I don't want to get into the talking about that stuff. But by God's words, though, it appears to be before the child is born when Nathan confronts David. Because he says the child that is will be born to you is going to die. And so that makes it sound as if the child's birth is imminent. Um, and Nathan is approaching David right before this child is born and confronting him and saying, here's going to be your punishment. And it's going to happen very soon. My guess is it's been probably close to nine months between David's sin and Nathan's rebuke. And that's important because David being a man after God's own heart, as the New Testament describes him, um, nine months is a long time, isn't it? To keep this sin on your mind, to have this rift between you and God because of something you've done like this. But he carries this sin, I think, for almost nine months without doing anything about it. Very dark time in David's life. Now, um, how did David feel during this period? Well, for that we need to go to two psalms, and we're going to go to Psalm 32, and we're going to go to Psalm 51 to talk about this. Uh, Psalm 32, and I want to read uh, Psalm 32, in fact, maybe you could get someone from the class to read it here. Psalm 32, um, can someone read that for me? Anybody? Psalm 32? When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. Okay. So the whole song. Let's read the whole song, though. Oh, sorry. I'll just read the whole three and four. Yeah, go ahead. Read, read the whole song if you want to. <clears throat> Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. For when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Therefore, let everyone who is godly offer prayer to you at a time when you may, may be found. Surely in the rush of great waters they shall not reach him. You are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with shouts of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Be not like a horse or a mule without understanding, which must be curbed with bit and brittle, bridle, or it will not stay near you. Many are the sorrows of the wicked, but steadfast love surrounds. But steadfast love surrounds the one who trusts in the Lord. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, O righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. Okay. So, how is this sin? How is this sin affecting David? Was it just like a little pinprick? Or was it affecting him substantially? His hands heavy upon him. Yeah. This had a serious effect on David, right? Someone who walked with God, something like what he had done was not just going to be brushed to the side. And David had a hard time dealing with this while he was basically away from God, didn't he? His sin... Uh, it, it sounds almost like made him suffer physically. Like he had a, like he was physically sick because of this. 
or at least here, it's definitely affected his, his psyche. He is miserable because he knows this sin exists. And he, his conscience is not letting him have any peace because of it. Yes? Well, I mean, it's, we think about getting ulcers, right, from stress. And you know that, that terrible feeling in the pit of your stomach. And that's a physical sensation. And that's what this sounds like to me. Yeah. Like, he was, he was suffering physically because of the way he felt about what he had done. And it's because his conscience wouldn't let him have peace uh, because he still had one. Now, eventually, after Nathan goes to David, David doesn't try and deny it, does he? He doesn't try and deny, well, I didn't do this. He doesn't try to blame anybody else. What he does is he said, I've sinned, right? He said, I acknowledge my sin to you, this is Psalm 32, and I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I would confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Now, in David's case, God said, you're not going to die for this, right? The penalty under the law for murder was death. So David should have died for what he did to Uriah. But God forgives him and says, you're not going to die. Now, in Psalm 52, he says, Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. So how did David feel about his sin? Is that true that David had only sinned against God? Well, everybody thinks not really because he sinned against Bathsheba. He sinned against Uriah. And the consequences was the death of a baby. And so, um, you know, he, he did do that, but he acknowledged that he sinned against God. Because that's the ultimate that, that's who forgives the sin that you confess. Yeah. We're, I want to make the point a little bit later on about why this is important. But the fact of the matter is he, he didn't just sin against God, did he? He sinned against Bathsheba. He sinned against Uriah, the Hittite. Um, he got Joab to help him in committing the murder. And he sinned against multiple people here. But how does David feel about it? I don't think it's just that he, he, he thinks that he hasn't sinned against these people. But to him, his primary concern is that he has sinned against God. And that, I think, tells you something about his relationship with God, that that's the one whom he is concerned about having wrong. Yes? I think that you're, I think you're right. I would look at this too as a way to show honor to God, mm -hmm. that he is the only God, the only judge, the only one who oversees all of this. So I don't think that's necessarily that he's excluding the people that he wronged either. I think that, you know, talking about like a jealous God, one and only God, I think it's a way of showing reverence for Absolutely. I don't think he's talking. I don't think he's saying he hasn't said. I think this is talking about how he feels and who he feels it's most important that he has sinned against. He knows he's sinned against all these other people. But to him, it's the fact that he's sinned against God that is what's really bothering him. That's what's wrong at the core. Yes? Well, and in fact, well, the sin against the people, <clears throat> the sin against God may be the less obvious. I mean, the sin against Bathsheba and, and Uriah is obvious, right? The one, but we sometimes we might miss, and people, it, it, other Israelites might have missed, that really, you know, you're sinning against God when you sin against other people. That's not always the connection that's made. And I think David is just really making that connection here, that I have sinned against you deeply, not just these people. Yeah. I was going to say, I, it's interesting to look at 
the, the related Psalms and the story in Samuel at the same time. Because some, somewhat presumably the Psalms are written with retrospect. Especially since we, we were speculating at the beginning, right? What was, what was David's mindset when he got told what to us is like the most obvious, you know, allegory to his sin? Yeah. And he was like, what? You know, he's, he's freaking out. And it's almost like this, at least one lesson I'm taking from it, right? Is there, there's, a, there's a difference between, you, you know, stopping sinning and asking for forgiveness and, and, and offering penance. And obviously David had a very unique relationship, and we have different avenues now, but it's not just like, okay, well, I just won't do it again, and I'll get, like, morally outraged at the, 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 the concept. There, there is a, you know, a lesson that we need to acknowledge or take responsibility for our sins, you know, somewhat purposefully. Yeah. And I do kind of wonder if there wasn't a little bit of that. I kind of wonder if the reason why he's, he's mad at... <clears throat> At this fictional man in Nathan's story is because deep down he knows what he's done is wrong, but he has somehow this belief that if he's just if he's righteous now, without going back and dealing with the sin, if he's righteous now, that's gonna make everything okay. And but that's not the same. So, um, to Sean's point too, like I think that uh, we've seen two examples of that exact thing of somebody who like kind of stops sinning but then starts up again in Saul because Saul did the exact same thing where he wasn't where he was supposed to be uh, leading his people being king and defending his nation he was out on the hunt for David at times and there was one time where he was chasing David and he got called back because the Philistines the Philistines pulled a raid on the people back home so he's like pursuing what he wants and then panics and gets back. And each time David could have killed Saul, like when he had his robe outside the cave. Saul's like, I'm sorry, forgive me, forgive me. And then he goes, tries to kill him again, like tries to hunt him down again. David gets his spear and his jug of water from the time they're camping close to him. David again calls out, I could have killed you, but I didn't. And Saul's like, forgive me, forgive me. And like, keeps going back to it. Whereas David... You can see that his heart is broken over this, that he like does get to that realization that he must change. Whereas Saul, I don't think ever got to that point of, I must change. Right. It got to the point of, oh, I gotta stop, but I can't help myself, I'm gonna go back to it. Yes. You're about three slots. <laughs> two or three slots ahead. Yeah, that's, yeah, yeah, that's a great sorry. comment though. Yeah. That's a great comment though. There is a contrast there between Saul and David that is very obvious. And, and Psalm 51, 16 through 17, David says, For you will not delight in sacrifice, for I would give it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. And that's the big difference between Saul when he's confronted with his sin. And David, when he's confronted with this sin by Nathan, right? What is Saul's response um, to the, and I think it's, uh, there we go. What's the difference between David's response and Saul's response? Well, David is cut to the heart, right? Nathan's just laid out his sin for him, and he admits to it, and he is truly penitent. What's Saul's response, though, when Samuel comes to him and says, you disobeyed God, you didn't kill everything of the uh, Amalekites that you were supposed to, you left the king alive, you left the people, be what's Saul's response to that? The people made me do it. The people made me do it, but then furthermore, is he really truly penitent? No. No? No, he rationalized the whole thing. He says, I did obey God. He basically tried to say, I did it. Yeah. He says, I didn't do this one thing. Then when Samuel finally calls it on, finally calls him on it, what does he say to Samuel? He says, yes, I've sinned, but please, so that I don't look bad. Stay with me. Stay with me, right? Let's show a united front. Does that sound like someone who's 
concerned about what God thinks about his sin. He's just been told that the kingdom's going to be taken away from him. And he's concerned that he's going to look bad. Not about what God thinks about it. Now, this is in 1 Samuel 15. This is the story of the Amalekites. There's an earlier story in 1 Samuel 13 where there's a battle with the Philistines and Samuel is late. And so Saul offers up a sacrifice that he's not supposed to. Only the priests were supposed to offer sacrifices. And... Of course, Saul being from the tribe of Benjamin, he's not allowed to do that. But he goes in and he offers a sacrifice. And Samuel comes up to him and basically tells him, you should have waited. You've sinned now. You should have waited. He tells him right then and there that the kingdom's going to be taken away from him. God's decided to take the kingdom away from him. So this instance with Saul and the Amalekites in 1 Samuel 15... That is like a second chance for Saul. He's been given the first chance and he blew it in 1 Samuel 13. Now he's got a chance to obey God, do everything God says, and what does he do? He blows it again, blames the people, won't admit that he actually was responsible, and then is not concerned at all about what God thinks, but is concerned about saving faith. So Psalm 51, if you will not delight the sacrifice, or I would give it, you will not be pleased with the burnt offering. Samuel said, has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to listen than without rams. Saul missed the purpose, didn't he, of sacrifice. Because in one instance, he thinks he's going to offer sacrifice, but instead of obeying God and letting Samuel offer it, he offers a sacrifice himself. He missed the purpose of it. Letting the people take the, the spoil, the livestock, to sacrifice. Again, he's missed the purpose, hasn't he, of sacrificing. He's missed the purpose because he thinks that sacrifices are more important than actually listening to God. But what I want to show from here, though, is that it's the penitent heart that Saul's missing. That's the difference. That's why David is described as a man after God's own heart, even though he did something truly terrible. What does he feel when he's confronted with that? He's torn apart. And he's torn apart. He admits what he's done. He repents. Saul, on the other hand, does not. All right. What produces repentance and the acceptance of responsibility for one's sentence? Conscience. Conscience. Okay, your conscience. The answer, I believe, is godly grief. Now, let's go to 2 Corinthians 7, 8 through 10. I know that was a very uh, pickup kind of thing. Looking for a specific answer. And if I for those of you who know Harry Pickup, he would like that. He, he would ask you for an answer, and if you didn't give the exact answer he wanted. <laughs> Alright. So Paul says, For even if I made you grieve with my letter, I do not regret it, though I did regret it, for I see that uh, that letter grieved you, though only for a while. As it is, I rejoice, not because you were grieved, but because you were grieved into repenting. For you felt a godly sorrow, godly grief, so that you suffered no loss through us. For godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly grief produces death. What's godly sorrow? It's this attitude that David shows. Right? Against you, you only, have I sinned. David is not concerned about what his sin is going to do to his reputation. He's not concerned about what his sin is going to do to his lifestyle. God's going to punish him with trouble. He's concerned about what God thinks, isn't he? About what God's opinion is of him. He's concerned that he has sinned against God. God who he has a close relationship with. God who he worships. God who he prays to. That's what he's concerned about. 
That's godly sorrow right there. David has godly sorrow. The people on the day of Pentecost, another example of godly sorrow. They've just been told on the day of Pentecost that this Messiah, whom these people have been looking for their entire lives, they've been told he's coming, right? The nation is anxiously awaiting him. They've just been told that they have crucified him. And what's their response? What are we going to do? <laughs> yeah. Do they blame their leaders? You know, it, it wasn't us, the comp people, right? It was, it was really the leaders who did, the chief priests and the Pharisees. It was those people who, who did it, right? We're not to blame. Did they do any of that blame shifting? Complaining about how it was somebody else's fault? No. Well, they were doing that before they were cut to the heart. That's when it got to it. Because at the beginning of that sermon, when Peter's talking to all of them, he's talking about Jesus, and he says the, basically, like in our modern terms, we would say something like, admit it, like you guys have seen this, mm -hmm. and you're denying it, so stop denying it. And yeah. finally they got to it where he challenged them, and, and then they were cut to the heart. Yeah. Well, even earlier on, they said, let, let his blood be upon our heads and our children's. Yeah, but the, the point here, the point I want to make is that this is godly sorrow. When we accept responsibility for our actions, we don't blame others. When we have godly sorrow for what we have done wrong, we don't blame other people. We don't complain about it being other people's fault, our sins being other people's faults. Um, and this is, blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. I think that's important because our spirit can deceive us, right? We can deceive ourselves into thinking that our sins are somebody else's fault, somebody else's responsibility. It's not us who's responsible for them. And David, I think, is the perfect example of someone who was called on it, and he confessed to it. He admitted and he took responsibility for it. And he took his punishment, didn't he? God forgave him and that he didn't die. He still had to suffer the consequences, right? Even though David had to suffer the consequences for his sin, he was still so grateful to God that God had forgiven him. Even though he had to pay the consequences, he had to, he had to suffer the punishment. Okay. Uh, yes. I think that uh, we have a, a very common uh, temptation in this, in this area uh, because if we wrong a brother or a sister over something that we think is, ah, they're being just so sensitive about it. There's, they're, that's the pro they're, it's their problem. They need to deal with it. Fine, I'll say I'm sorry. Right? But we don't have that repentant heart of thinking of actually loving them helping them through it and helping them possibly come even if it is an overreaction helping them to come to a better understanding through teaching or whatever I think that that's a common temptation that we have to not have that sincere sorry like sorry to say it in a Canadian way but you know to, it, it's that old phrase like are you really sorry or are you just saying it no it yeah, I, I agree. It's very easy, isn't it, to, to say you're sorry, but on the inside, what we're really doing is we're, we're blaming someone else for being too uh, emotional or too, uh, what's the word you use? Sensitive. Like oversensitive. Yeah. And that sensitive, goes on. Right? That's yeah. a very real thing. But we still have the capability to be stronger and to like sincerely look out for one another. And let them know we really do care in, in a way that is uh, helpful. Yeah. One more comment and then we'll, we'll go. Well, sorry, I know the bell rang. I was just going to say that um, uh, David's perspective, you also see that he understands that there's no other way out of this sin 
like the sin has happened, there's a finality to it, and that the only way through it is God's forgiveness. And sometimes I think we don't appreciate that if we've sinned against somebody else, we have to beg for forgiveness, right? And, and that's what God, what, what's what David does. You know, and it seems like Saul tries to find some other way out where he tries to erase it somehow or, mm -hmm. or downplay it. David doesn't try to downplay it at all. This is all bad. I need your forgiveness, and that is the only way through. Okay, all right. Thank you, everyone. See you on Wednesday.